Chapter One of Armand Durand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Armand Durand, or A Promise Fulfilled, by Rosanna Le Proan. Chapter One among the earliest french settlers who had established themselves in the seigneury of alonville we will call it on the banks of the st lawrence was a family of the name of durand and the large and valuable farm which had come down from father to son in regular succession had enabled them always to maintain their position as leading men in the district in which their lot had been cast they were a strong and handsome race industrious and thrifty too though in no manner parsimonious paul durand tall straight with jet black hair and eyes dark skin and regular features was a good specimen of their male representatives unlike most of his countrymen who usually at least in the rural parts marry at a very early period of life paul had reached the age of thirty before he decided on taking to himself a wife the cause of this lay not so much in indifference to conjugal happiness as in the fact that for some years before he had attained the age of manhood his father had died and his widowed mother had thenceforth continued to live with him in the paternal homestead ruling alike his purse and household with a judicious though arbitrary hand his only sister francoise had married at sixteen a respectable country merchant in a neighboring village to whom she brought not only a handsome face but a comfortable dower so mrs durand was at liberty to watch over and devote herself entirely to her son what a fine old homestead was that over which she presided and how strong is the temptation to pause and describe it the house of rough masonry was substantially though irregularly built with a large elm shadowing the front and dazzlingly white outbuildings and fences these latter were all regularly whitewashed every year a proceeding which imparted an additional air of thrift to the well-kept well-stocked farmyard at one end of the building stretched out the garden a quaint mixture of vegetables and flowers where superb moss roses flanked beds of onions and delicate heart's ease asters and carnations bordered squares of beets and carrots in one corner conveniently located amid a perfect wilderness of blossoms of every hue and shape was a long wooden stand on which were ranged some eight or ten beehives but why linger over the description any one who has sailed past the banks of our noble st lawrence or those of the smaller though picturesque richelieu must have seen many such homes probably paul durand feared that the conflicting claims of a wife and a mother in the one household might not answer as well in his home as it did in that of many others on account of the difficulty the elder mrs durand might find in yielding any portion of the authority she had heretofore sovereignly wielded it was therefore only after the mourning put on for that well-loved mother who had died in his arms had been worn its allotted period that he commenced thinking of looking for a companion to fill the void death had made in the old farmhouse the chief difficulty of the task however lay in the number he would have to choose from for the richest dowered as well as handsomest girls of the parish would have looked favourably on his suit but not among them was his choice destined to be made the seigneur of alonville was a wealthy kind-hearted man named de courval and as he was hospitable like most of his class his large substantially built manor-house was filled every summer with a succession of friends from the neighboring parishes or from montreal in which city most of his relatives resided among these latter was a family but recently arrived from france and most willingly they accepted mr de courval's pressing invitation to spend part of the summer with him mr and mrs lubois came bringing in their train two young children aged respectively seven and nine and their nursery governess the latter genevieve audet 
was a pale fragile-looking girl with delicate pretty features and quiet timid manners educated sufficiently for the humble post she occupied but possessing in reality no great acquirements beyond it she was a portionless cousin seven times removed of the family she lived with and in her case as in that of many others the circumstance of relationship by no means improved her condition they generally ignored whilst she never even hinted at the fact the only effect of it apparently being to prevent her bettering her condition by seeking a situation in another family lest the doing so should bring discredit on the connection which was such a barren honour to her paul durand often called at mr de courval's partly because they had some interests in common having purchased between them a large tract of swampy ground at a nominal price which they were now proceeding to utilize by draining and partly because these visits were a source of real pleasure to mr de courval who was as excellent a farmer in theory as durand was in practice and delighted to talk over crops drainage and farm stock with one whose success in all these things was so good an illustration of the justice of his opinions concerning them when he called at the manor-house if the master of the establishment had visitors staying with him he and paul generally betook themselves to the quiet room which served the double purposes of library and office and there they chatted and smoked mr de courval's excellent tobacco undisturbed the latter would willingly have introduced paul to his more fashionable friends for he both esteemed and respected him but durand naturally avoided society in which the conversation generally ranged on town topics with which he was unacquainted and the interlocutors in which dialogues were sometimes at little pains to hide the species of contemptuous indifference they felt for his social position in coming and going he often encountered genevieve audet and her little charges and he sometimes felt grieved sometimes irritated by the species of tyranny the spoiled unruly children seemed to exercise over their luckless governess simple and straightforward in all things he one day communicated his opinions on the subject to mr de courval and without perceiving the pleasant twinkle ominous of matchmaking that suddenly gleamed in that gentleman's eye paul placidly listened to an eloquent panegyric on miss audet's virtues accompanied by some touching allusions to her trials and troubles which were indeed only too well grounded then his host asked him to accompany him to look at his splendid mangle wurzel and somehow or other they strolled up to where genevieve sat under a spreading maple trying to coax her unruly pupils to learn that canada was not in africa as they persisted in asserting it was what more natural than that mr de courval should introduce his companion to the governess and then whilst they exchanged a few words address some laughing remarks to the children which soon drew down on him a torrent of childish chatter genevieve's manner had very little of the animation for which french women are famed and the sad lessons her short young life had already afforded had imparted a reserved almost cold tone to language and manner yet paul found himself strangely attracted toward her she was so delicate so helpless looking in appearance so desolate so unhappy in reality that he could not avoid feeling that species of inward impulse which all noble manly men know in the presence of oppressed weakness the desire to protect and succor the interview lasted much longer than he was aware for it had proved a very interesting one nor was it the last for a couple of days after mr de courval sent for him to come and inspect some vegetable monster in the shape of a huge turnip capable of winning a prize not only for its size but also for its ugliness and inferiority in point of taste or nutritious properties the curiosity was duly examined and commented on and then in strolling round they came again upon miss audet and her charges 
and again mr de courval engaged the latter in noisy childish talk whilst durand by no means backward addressed himself to their governess the favourable impression made on him by the latter was strengthened by this second interview and fully confirmed by one or two subsequent meetings there was no longer any necessity for mr de courval's sending for paul for he now had constantly some message to bring to the manor-house or some question to ask the seigneur there were no obstacles in the way for mrs lubois and her husband had returned to montreal leaving their children and governess at mr de courval's kindly urged request at his house his old housekeeper a respectable widow occupying a place in his household superior to that of a common servant being there to satisfy propriety one sultry afternoon that paul was taking his way thither thinking very little of his ostensible message and very much of genevieve Audet, he perceived the latter seated with her pupils under a cluster of towering pines a little out of the direct road to the house and he bent his steps towards them his movements were slow the soft green turf gave back no echo of his footsteps so the group under the pines were totally unconscious of his approach probably had it been otherwise the scene he witnessed would have been somewhat modified in its developments the governess very pale and unhappy-looking was seated on a low garden stool a half-closed book in her hand her youngest pupil was beside her betraying by laugh and look the high approval he bestowed on the spirited conduct of his elder brother who stood in front of the hapless genevieve defiance flashing from his eyes whilst he informed her that he would not learn any longer from her because his mamma had often said she was not able to teach him and that she did not know how to direct or bring up children with wonderful gentleness the girl rejoined that even if mrs lubois had said so he must learn from and obey herself till his mamma had procured another governess and that duty obliged her to insist till then on his learning the lessons in which he was so backward that's all your fault shouted the young rebel mamma says we will never learn anything till we have a tutor and that she would get us one to-morrow only she does not know what to do with you nobody will marry you as you have no dough marriage portion in general paul was exceedingly tolerant of the shortcomings of children and no clover fields were so boldly invaded for strawberries in summer nor trees so fearlessly climbed into for wild plums and nuts in autumn as were his indeed he was frequently taken to task by his neighbours on the score that his excessive leniency had a most demoralising effect on the youth of the village to which rebuke he would reply that they must not forget that they had all been children once in the present instance however he fiercely clenched his hand whilst an expletive better left unrecorded escaped his lips fearing for his self-command and knowing that interference at the present moment might prove most injudicious on miss Audet's account he abruptly turned down a dense alley of evergreens and after having arrived in the midst of the walk threw himself down full length on the green sward and taking out his handkerchief wiped his forehead he seemed strangely moved but paul durand never indulged in soliloquy so after a half hour's deep thought he rose and slowly walked back to the spot in which he had left genevieve she was still there her eyes intently bent on the earth and a look more weary and languid than usual on her small regular features the shrill voices of the children engaged in a noisy game of romps re-echoed near but she did not seem to hear them or durand either as he quietly accosted her on his repeating the usual salutation in a louder key she looked up and he then said i suppose i must not ask what miss Audet was thinking of her thoughts seemed very far away yes they were in france ah without doubt because miss genevieve has many friends there whom she dearly loves no 
was the softly spoken reply i have none there now there was nothing sentimental or affected in the quiet voice in which this was said and paul looked silently down at her the golden sunlight slanting between the branches lighted up the delicate oval face the large soft eyes and though he had never read a novel in his life he felt the magic charm of the scene and situation as keenly as if he weakly perused half a dozen of them long and earnest was his scrutiny noting face and form even to the slight small fingers that mechanically turned the leaves of the book she still held and on which her eyes were again bent and then he inwardly said such a girl as that indeed not able to marry without a dot ah madame lubois we shall see with the courtesy and ease of manner which the canadian farmer no matter how poor or illiterate he may be usually possesses he seated himself on the long garden bench beside her and now if the reader anticipates or dreads a love scene we hasten to assure him or her the supposition is groundless and will content ourselves with saying that when paul durand and genevieve slowly walked up to the house a half hour afterwards they were promised man and wife the deep flush on the girl's face the brilliancy of her eyes told of happiness as well as emotion and in paul's look there was a blending of honest exultation tempered with a tender gentleness of look and manner that augured well for the future of both very undemonstrative very quiet lovers were they however so much so that when mr de courval suddenly came upon them the faintest suspicion of the real state of matters never dawned on him and merely inwardly thinking how unusually well genevieve looked he pressingly asked durand up to the house the latter accepted the invitation and genevieve suddenly anxious on the score of her unruly pupils turned her steps towards the summer-house from which their voices proceeded raised in angry dispute seated in mr de courval's study durand without much circumlocution informed his well-pleased host of what had just taken place begging him to fulfil the duty of writing to inform mrs lubois of the state of affairs please tell her mr de courval terminated the suitor to allow the marriage to take place as soon as possible and above all things don't forget to say that i want no dot mrs lubois was written to a cold answer soon came saying that genevieve was free to do as she pleased but as the match was not a remarkably brilliant one there was no reason for immoderate haste the parties interested especially durand thought otherwise and a couple of weeks afterwards they were married in the village church very early in the morning mr de courval triumphantly giving away the bride as mr lubois had found it impossible to be in alonville at that particular time the breakfast given by the good-natured seigneur was sumptuous though there were so few to partake of it and as he heartily shook durand's hand at parting he slyly whispered how well we have got on after all without our noble cousins it was probably the fear of this very cousinship being claimed by the new married couple that prompted the unkind and otherwise unaccountable indifference the lupois had displayed during the course of the wooing and wedding they were not going they angrily reasoned to expose themselves to the incursions of unpolished country clodhoppers mr de courval might make as much of the farmer durand as he liked because he lived in the country where society was not only limited but less select they however could not think of admitting hobnailed boots and rustic manners into their aristocratic drawing-room End of chapter 1
no small amount of jealousy had been excited in alonville by the unexpected and speedy manner in which the best match of the parish had thus been appropriated by a stranger and the tongues of mothers and daughters were alike busy and merciless in their denunciations of such a step what could he see in her indeed a little doll-faced creature with no life or gaiety in her to bewitch him in such a manner what made him marry a stranger when there were plenty of smart handsome girls in his own village that he had known ever since they wore pinafores she had pretty little feet to be sure and small dainty hands but were they good for anything could they bake spin milk or do anything useful ah well retribution would come to paul durand and he would yet mourn in sackcloth and ashes the fine girls he had passed by to marry that little puppet but all these lamentations and prophecies were unavailing and in no manner disturbed the serenity of the two individuals who were the objects of them were they all unfounded alas that we should have to record it not quite the bride knew little if anything of housekeeping this was the more unfortunate as the elderly woman who had superintended durand's household skilfully enough since his mother's death had abruptly taken leave when informed of his intended nuptials it was not so much that she felt incensed at the idea of his introducing a wife into the establishment his chief fault lay in his having ignored the charms of a certain niece of her own who could boast of a really handsome face as well as comfortable dower and whom la mere niquette had decided many months previous was a suitable wife for him with this end in view she had sounded sophie's praises night and morning lauded sophie's qualities mental and moral dilated on her admirable housekeeping skill and the patience with which durand had listened to talk which he judged the result of the garrulousness of age unfortunately confirming her in her illusions which were shared by the fair sophie herself she felt too much aggrieved to remain beneath his roof after seeing her dreams so rudely dispelled the two inexperienced girls hired at the last moment to replace her though stout and willing were otherwise incompetent and the bride was thus thrown entirely on her own resources with a vague presentiment of coming trouble paul had done his utmost to induce the injured mrs niquette to retain her post he had expostulated solicited and offered what was considered then almost fabulous wages for her continued services but revenge to some natures is very sweet and she could not forego it forgetful of the kindness the consideration with which her employer had always regarded her the presents the privileges he had bestowed with a liberal hand she worked herself up to a belief that she had been treated with the most signal ingratitude and that she was really an injured personage ah she thought as she left him with a good-bye mr durand to which he coldly responded i'll soon see you arrive my gay bridegroom begging me to come back but i won't do that till you and your dainty wife have prayed long and hard and then when i do return i'll teach you both how to respect la mere niquette but the good old dame was mistaken neither her master nor his bride troubled her with solicitations to return long as she had lived with paul durand she had not fathomed his character yet as we have before said the women of the durand family were always notable housewives and during the long reign of the last worthy lady who had borne that name paul's house had been the best managed the most neatly kept in the village whilst his dairy products were equally famed for quantity and quality this satisfactory state of things had deteriorated very little if any during mrs niquette's rule who to do her justice had looked as narrowly to the comforts of paul and the interests of the establishment as her late mistress had done alas under the new dynasty things were very different and it was to be hoped for the sake of the departed mrs durand's peace of mind that she was not cognizant of sublunary matters 
especially of details concerning her son's household the latter liked a good table and had always been accustomed to one now the soup was often burned or watery the bread sour and heavy worthy of the wretched butter destined to be eaten with it whilst the crisp brown pancakes crullers and dainty preserves that had at one time so frequently adorned his table were things of the past still with the generosity of a manly nature he neither scolded nor grumbled but contented himself with a laughing hint occasionally on the subject never alluding to it however when his wife looked worried or troubled poor genevieve did often make spasmodic efforts to acquire a small portion of the valuable science in which she was so lamentably deficient but the results were always discouraging failures and she was gradually coming to the fatal conclusion that it was no use to try as if to make matters worse paul's sister who had just been left a widow wrote to announce that her health shaken by anxiety and fatigue during her husband's illness required change of air and she felt assured her brother and new sister would kindly receive her for a few weeks ah how honest paul durand dreaded that visit how his heart ached as he thought of his poor little wife's shortcomings laid bare to the keen gaze of that pattern and model of housewives as to genevieve herself she counted the days and hours as the criminal counts the time that has to elapse before the execution of his sentence her suspense was not of long duration for three days after her letter mrs chartron arrived despite her recent bereavement which she really deeply felt despite her own somewhat shaken health and energy the state of matters in her brother's household alarmed almost horrified her vague rumors had indeed occasionally reached her ear of the housekeeping deficiencies of her new sister-in-law but occupied entirely with her husband who had been confined to his room three or four months previous to his death she had scarcely heeded them now they burst upon her in all their appalling reality and perhaps no greater distraction to her legitimate sorrow could have been found than the new field of regret thus opened to her how she inwardly asked herself can i find time to grieve for my poor louis's loss when i see such wretched bread such uneatable butter on my brother's table how can i dwell on my own state of lonely widowhood when i see those abominable servants of my brothers gossiping with their bows whilst the dinner is burning on the stove and the cream going to waste in the dairy oh it is distracting distracting it proved indeed for before mrs chartrand had been a week in the house she had almost forgotten her woes and her weeds in the fierce astonishment excited by a farther insight into the waste and mismanagement of the household for genevieve she experienced no sentiment beyond that of contemptuous pity and a keen regret that paul had made so sad a mistake in his choice that strong bustling active woman brought up to housekeeping from her cradle could not understand the sick languor the weary discouragement to which her weak nervous sister-in-law was so often a prey and more than once she inwardly accused the latter of mincing affectation affairs could not go on long in this way without her disburdening her heart to some one and one sunday afternoon after having declined accompanying genevieve under some pretext to afternoon service she entered the room where paul was smoking in peaceful solitude there was no misinterpreting the determination that sat enthroned on her brow the portentous solemnity of her manner and he inwardly made up his mind for a scene but like a wary tactician he awaited the attack in silence paul she suddenly burst forth put down your pipe and listen to me i want to have a talk with you a talk about what was the brief response about what you ask me what could it be else than the woeful mismanagement of your household i think that is entirely my business and genevieve's 
he dryly replied resuming the pipe he had momentarily laid down that answer might do for a stranger but it is not a just one to make to your elder and only sister who in speaking to you is moved entirely by affectionate interest for yourself give me one fair patient hearing and i will not ask another let me now say unreservedly all that is on my mind and then if you wish it i will for ever after hold my peace feeling there was some truth in her words durand silently nodded and she resumed in our poor mother's time though you had not more cows in your pasture than you have now indeed less for you have added three beautiful heifers to the stock there were always a few firkins of sweet well-made butter ranged in your cellar ready for market when the price should be satisfactory there was a goodly row of cheeses on your shelves and baskets of eggs how is it now nothing for sale at present and there will be nothing later in one corner of the untidy dairy a firkin of some pale streaky substance which we must call butter i suppose as it would answer to no other name a dozen of eggs perhaps on a cracked plate some mouldy cream and that is the extent of your dairy riches are things better in your poultry yard remembering the broods of thriving poultry turkeys and geese that used at one time to people it my heart fairly aches when i watch now the couple of lonely goslings and turkeys or the handful of wretched little bantams wild as woodcocks that pick up a living as best they can for half of the time they are not fed though enough is wasted from each meal to fit them for prize fowl what do you say to all this brother i tell you that you are on the high road to ruin no francoise there is no danger of that god is very good to me here the speaker reverently doffed his cap my harvest this year is beyond any that i have yet gathered in though i have had my granaries often well filled everything has prospered with me in quantity as well as quality and we will not thank heaven miss the profits of dairy or poultry yard well tis a great blessing paul that you are so lucky you require to be so but what about your own comforts your table you must not be angry with my plain speaking for you have given me leave to say what was on my mind your table i believe is the worst supplied in the parish i am sure francoise we have had some very good pies lately and fruit tarts ah brother you may well look sheepish and pretend to stare into the bowl of your pipe as you say that you cannot deceive me though you try to i saw widow lapointe's little girl stealing into the yard with them on three different occasions anything as tempting as them in the cooking line could not be produced in this house now unless i turned up my sleeves and went to work myself poor paul felt considerably disconcerted for he had secretly called at widow lapointe's and prepaid for the confection of the dainties in person hoping his sharp-sighted sister might suppose they were of home manufacture he worked still harder though in silence at his pipe while mrs chartron piteously went on look at the garden which can be compared only to that of the sluggard overgrown with weeds and nettles and yet i see two great strong lazy girls lounging about here mother kept but one still in her time the same garden was admired by all the parish for its fine display of vegetables fruits even flowers i see no signs either of new home-made linen nor yet of good grey homespun such as every durand wife has always been able to make for her husband and her children will you tell me what can or what does genevieve do a flush had been gradually stealing over durand's swarthy countenance and at length heavily striking the table he retorted that is my business francoise only mine do you hear and had it not been for my promise to let you speak you would not have been able to say so much i know that was mrs chartrand's philosophical reply but as you passed your word to give me a fair hearing i shall keep you to it is not every syllable i've uttered true as gospel have i maligned genevieve in one single point 
if i am satisfied with my wife who else has a right to find fault with her was the loud-voiced interrogation you need not look so fiercely at me paul i see you want to quarrel but i will not gratify you tis always the way with you men when your cause is a bad one you always try to prop it up with angry words and blustering now i will have my say out if you stormed twice as much god knows no unkind or angry feeling towards your wife lives in my heart and it is for her good as well as yours that i should speak plainly no one was more delighted than myself when i heard of your marriage because i thought it would be for your happiness and so it was francoise and i am as happy as a king nor do i intend to make myself and my poor little wife miserable by asking her to do what she is not able to do she is not made for strong or heavy work no more than the little singing birds twittering in the elm outside besides she is young and will learn mrs chartrand inwardly thought that women as young and delicate as genevieve had often made good managers and housekeepers but she prudently kept her reflections on that point to herself and resumed without blaming your wife for her ignorance of housekeeping don't you think it would be wise for her to begin to learn at once your crops may not always prove as good as this year children bringing fresh expenses may come and the ruin you now laugh at overtake you later listen and i will make you an offer i am a childless widow free to follow my own wishes say the word and i will make my home here i will be no burden for you know i have sufficient means of my own i will teach genevieve housekeeping if she has strength or desire to learn and in any case i will take the whole burden of the household on my own shoulders your comfort your purse and happiness will gain by it now reflect well before you give me an answer either one way or the other paul durand did so he crossed his arms on the table and rested his head on them in deep earnest thought certainly the material prosperity of his establishment beneath that thrifty housewife's care would materially increase but how would genevieve like it that was an important question firkins of butter stores of cheese would accumulate in his cellars home-made cloth and linen in his cupboards and when he would return from his farm labors hungry and tired tempting well-prepared meals would await him yes it would be very pleasant for him but would it be so for his wife who would pass the hours of his absence in shrinking from the constant supervision his sister would exercise over everything and every person around her how miserable how mortified would she feel brought perpetually into such vivid contrast with the skilful energetic madame chartron made to feel so keenly her inferiority on all the points in which the other excelled no he had no right to risk his wife's happiness by bringing a third party to dwell beneath his roof and in a kind though firm tone he rejoined thank you francoise for your kind offer the prompting i know of a good heart but i think it better that i and my little genevieve should rough it alone troubles we will have i suppose like most married people but we must try to bear them patiently and if genevieve is wanting in some things she possesses at least a gentle affectionate nature and a loving heart tis finally settled then paul yes you're not angry no do you not think i have better sense than that but i must leave to-morrow i could not endure any longer the trials to which both my temper and my patience are continually exposed in this house between genevieve's indifference and the shameless negligence of her two lazy girls i would be worried to death before a fortnight debarred as i would be from trying to set things right why they have almost made me lose sight of my poor dead husband and of that decent grief which as a respectable widow i am bound to feel i will go to my room now and read some prayers for i missed vespers this holy sunday to have a talk with you 
she left the room and paul lapsed into a brown study from which he was at length roused by the entrance of his wife come here genevieve she obeyed and passing his arm around her he said looking earnestly into her face my sister wishes to come to live with us she will take all the charge of the housekeeping into her hands the bride's pale cheek slightly reddened her lip quivered but with an effort of self-control she quietly answered of course paul if you wish it no my little wife it shall not be no one shall come between you and i and we'll struggle through our troubles unhelped i have already told sister francoise so and the blame of refusal will rest entirely with myself how eloquently the lustrous brown eyes thanked him how tenderly the small fingers closed on his own reconciling him in their mute expression of affection to the many shortcomings that mrs chartrand had so piteously laid before him the latter kept her resolution of taking an early leave and the following morning whilst sunrise was still flushing the east mounted into the comfortable little spring cart in which her brother was to drive her back to her own abode if paul had felt any qualms of conscience for his refusal of her kindly intended offer the sight of her plump portly figure and full ruddy cheeks which he inwardly contrasted with his wife's frail little frame and delicate face fully reconciled him to the past after mrs chartrand's visit one of the incapables was dismissed and a substitute procured in the shape of a rare housekeeper who could do everything almost as well as mrs chartrand herself but alas she had a terrible temper and would pounce like a tigress on that innocent lamb her mistress without the slightest provocation knowing her value genevieve bore everything patiently but one afternoon that marie was venting her constitutional ill-temper in sundry insolent remarks as to what some people were sent into the world for when they were not able to even help a poor overworked servant with a churning or a baking her master whom she supposed busy in the farmyard entered unperceived and after listening a moment to her angry diatribes laid his hand on her shoulder and ordered her at once to pack up and go of course there was a storm afterwards and genevieve securely shut up in her room listened in nervous alarm to the uproar going on outside the rattling of crockery the warlike clashing of knives and the spasmodic movements of chairs benches pails kicked over in turn it subsided however in time and husband and wife felt equally relieved when the door closed upon their skilful but redoubtable help paul devoutly though somewhat obscurely thanking providence that they would have peace now even though they should soon be again in the midst of chaos referring probably to the general irregularity and confusion from which marie's activity had dragged the household End of chapter two chapter three of armand durand by rosanna le croan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary company still continued to come and go at mr de courval's for the month of october with its brightly tinted woods and hazy amber sky without speaking of the excellent shooting the environs of the place afforded rendered the country quite as attractive as it had been during the summer months gentlemen with guns and dogs gentlemen on horseback and on foot frequently passed durand's door but genevieve saw nothing of them mr de courval had frequently and kindly invited the new married couple to visit the manor-house but as paul evidently did not care about doing so whilst there were strangers there genevieve remained contentedly at home one afternoon she was standing in front of the door looking at the distant hills glowing in the mellow golden light of that beautiful season we call indian summer when mr de courval accompanied by two gentlemen friends passed on foot 
they all three looked weary and dispirited for they had been on foot since early morning and when genevieve whom mr de courval instantly accosted with his usual friendly politeness asked them to step in a moment and rest a thing she could not avoid doing without violating common courtesy for mr de courval complained of fatigue her offer was gladly accepted he introduced his friends one a mr caron a gentleman of middle age the other a handsome young cavalry officer named de chevandier who had come out from france to spend some months in canada the latter seemed equally surprised and struck by the pretty face and quiet graceful manners of their hostess as she placed before them tumblers with a jug of excellent cider which we need not inform our readers was not home-made genevieve however was entirely unconscious of the particular attention with which captain de chevandier favoured her and that very elegant young gentleman would have been highly mortified had he known that she had not even observed the glossy luxuriance of his dark hair and moustache or the classic regularity of his features durand came in before the departure of the guests and quite unembarrassed pressed hospitality upon them with kindly courtesy de chevandier's aristocratic prejudices were somewhat shocked by the appearance on the scene of this plebeian entertainer but his ineffable airs were as much thrown away on the husband as his looks of admiration had been on the wife at length the three gentlemen rested and refreshed took their departure the military adonis indulging in wondering regrets on their homeward way that such a charming little creature should be doomed to pass her whole life among cows fowls and all that sort of thing after they had left durand informed his wife that he was thinking of paying a visit to montreal to purchase groceries and other necessary articles as well as to see the merchant to whom he usually sold a large portion of his farm products concluding by inquiring if she would like to accompany him i can spare you a few dollars little wife to lay out on ribbons in the fine shops even though our butter and chickens have been failures he added with a smile expecting that genevieve would eagerly grasp at the offer for a trip to town even without the promise of spare dollars was considered a great privilege by the wives in allonville to his surprise indeed disappointment she reflected a moment hesitated then finally declined the reason of this was the uncertainty she felt as to how she should act towards the lubois did she go to town without calling to see them and thanking mrs lubois for the clumsy old-fashioned gold brooch she had sent her as a wedding present she might be taxed by the family with great ingratitude and yet on the other hand did she present herself with her husband at their exclusive mansion they might prove very unwelcome visitors to avoid this dilemma then she resolved on remaining at home especially as paul would not be absent more than a few days the day succeeding his departure genevieve who was exceedingly fond of the open air and could imagine no greater treat than to sit for hours on a bench in the garden or under the old elm that shaded so pleasantly her comfortable home listening to the chirping of birds and insect life around her betook herself with some pretence of needlework to her haunt behind the trunk of the great tree whose ample rotundity sheltered her in great part from the observation of passers-by whilst its foliage protected her from the sun she had been brought up in a dingy dirty town in france for there are dingy dirty towns in that favoured portion of the globe whatever may be said to the contrary and the country was to her an unexplored world as delightful as it was new how she revelled in her own quiet way in its freshness its beauty its perfumes and how every new phase of its life elicited an admiration which she did not dare to openly express lest she should expose herself to ridicule perhaps this predilection was in part responsible for the lamentably slow progress she was making in the acquirement of housekeeping knowledge for whilst she would be in person in the kitchen her head aching her cheeks aglow midst the fumes of frizzling stewing or broiling or what was still worse washing or scouring 
her thoughts would longingly turn to the cool pure air outside the rustling of the green boughs overhead and she would inwardly think with a sigh how much she would prefer a piece of bread and a cup of milk enjoyed amid that pleasant repose to the most dainty banquet heralded in by such culinary struggles and efforts comparatively free from household troubles for a while she had celebrated the first day of paul's absence by making a dinner on the primitive articles of fare just mentioned an arrangement which entirely suited her handmaidens who also fond of the dolce far niente added a piece of cold meat to their dinner and were satisfied ease making up for the frugality of their meal then taking a pair of slippers she was embroidering as a present for her husband and which she worked at in secret wishing to surprise him never doubting but that he would find them useful as they were ornamental she installed herself in her nook at the foot of the old elm what a glorious afternoon it was how often she paused in her work to look from the far-off purple hills to the gorgeous colouring of the autumn woods from the golden and azure glories of the sky above her to the flashing waves of the broad silvery st lawrence flowing past all was still the birds had already winged their way to climes that offered them another summer and the silence was only broken by the soft rustle of a leaf occasionally falling to the ground suddenly however a footstep near caused her to look up and there cap in hand his most winning smile on his handsome regular features stood captain de chevandier his manner was very courteous without being fulsome and genevieve listened undisturbed to some innocent remarks on the weather the country and the excellent shooting the time passed so pleasantly that she was unconscious when he took his departure that he had been nearly an hour in conversation with her the day following was as bright and pleasant as its predecessor had been and after a very light meal she hurried off with her canvas and wools not to the elm tree this time for a sort of instinct told her it was too much in the line of road traversed by mr de courval and his visitors but to another equally favoured haunt under a crooked but shady apple tree in the garden she was working most assiduously for she wished to complete her little offering before her husband's return when a clear cultivated voice pleasantly inquired how was mrs durand and glancing up she saw captain de chevandier looking at her over the low garden gate genevieve felt anything but gratified by this incident but she was too gentle to betray her sentiments on the subject so she politely returned his greetings still there was a considerable degree of reserve in her manner and de chevandier at a loss how to proceed looked about him for inspiration by good fortune his glance happened to fall on a bed of magnificent dahlias of various hues and shades and feigning great admiration of their beauty he asked permission to look at them nearer and gather one the permission was coldly granted and whilst dwelling with the air and manner of a connoisseur on the rich tints and peculiar beauty of the specimens before him he contrived to introduce a graceful compliment to the exquisite taste of the fair mistress of the garden and to the success which had attended her efforts you give me more credit than i deserve captain de chevandier tis the old housekeeper who lived with my husband before his marriage who deserves all your praise de chevandier bit his lip and inwardly blessed his stars that none of his witty caustic companions of the mess-table were present to witness this signal discomfiture soon recovering himself he resumed well that will not prevent me choosing with madame's permission a couple of those splendid crimson ones and he suited the action to the word then from the flowers it was natural to talk of the country and by a very natural transition from the country to france ah here was a link between them at last and de chevandier was not slow to seize upon it though a native of paris there were few parts of his sunny land which he had not visited and even with the dingy little town 
genevieve's birthplace he was acquainted having been detained there once a whole day by bad weather during which time he had continually cursed it as the smallest meanest most insufferable spot on the surface of the globe his recollections of it were now however of a different nature and he spoke of its simple church the quiet little cemetery with a pathos that almost brought tears to genevieve's eyes ah mrs durand he impetuously exclaimed after a moment's silence how miserable you must feel transplanted from our lovely land to this ungenial clime what are we here children of france but poor exiles genevieve was by no means prepared despite her love of fatherland to go such lengths as this and raising her eyes with a look of astonishment which never wavered before the half admiring half sentimental gaze bent on her she rejoined miserable do you say why mr de chevandier i have known more real happiness and quiet during the last few months than i have ever enjoyed in my life france is dear to me as a reminiscence but here in canada my affections as well as all my earthly hopes are centred this was another discouraging conversational blow from which either unable to rally or inferring from genevieve's manner that his stay had been sufficiently long he rose and after a few parting words uttered in the same strain of respectful courtesy with which he would have addressed a lady of the highest rank he withdrew as he closed the gate after him however he muttered what a straight-laced unsatisfactory little creature but then what matchless eyes what taper fingers surely that thick-headed husband of hers cannot expect them to do much in the way of milking or butter-making ah my worthy durand i am afraid you will find out too late that you have blundered egregiously in your choice with a look of deep thought on his usually careless features he strolled leisurely back to mr de courval's the ensuing day de chevandier made his toilet with elaborate care and having armed himself with some newspapers and magazines which he had lately received from france he bent his steps about the same hour in the direction of durand's habitation genevieve was not under the elm nor on looking over the gate could he see her under the apple tree evidently she did not wish for any farther interview but de chevandier was not easily daunted and rapping with the light cane he carried against the door he inquired of the untidy uncombed girl who opened it if madame were in she is somewhere in the garden was the curt response and feeling she had done all that could be expected from her under the circumstances she clapped the door to with a suddenness that caused the visitor to recoil what savages he exclaimed but i will not give it up i must seek her in the garden had captain de chevandier been asked what end or aim he had in view in paying such marked attention to mrs durand he would unhesitatingly have answered that he intended no harm mrs durand was a very pretty as well as refined woman and a harmless sentimental friendship kept up with her would serve greatly to lighten his visit at the manor-house which otherwise was passing very heavily but despite such vague semi-innocence of purpose on his part alas for genevieve if she encouraged or listened to his overtures for no religious principle guided him the only restraining influence he acknowledged was the world's code of honour and what a lax one that too often is inwardly wondering almost chafing at the intense interest she excited in him he unlatched the little gate and picking his steps amid pumpkins cucumbers and melons all growing in the most neglected luxuriance he made his way to the little rustic summer-house constructed out of a few boards round and over which a wild grapevine had been trained forming a covering of pleasant verdure genevieve was still at the eternal worsted work as de chevandier inwardly stigmatized it he would much rather have seen her melancholy and listless but with his usual graceful ease he entered offering his credentials in the shape of the books and papers he had brought with him 
genevieve could not do otherwise than thank him for his attention and besides she was really pleased to see the names and pictures of places and things so familiar to her whilst she was looking at the illustrated frontispiece of one of them he took up the work she had laid down smilingly asking for what the monument of female industry and patience he held in his hand was intended a pair of slippers for my husband was the reply an expression of keen irony flashed across de chevandier's features and as he thought of honest paul in his rough country boots striding through the muck of the farmyard and then looked at the delicate combination of beads and silk floss intended for him and the fairy-like fingers which had worked it his lip curled and he involuntarily said mr durand is a very happy man and will of course thoroughly appreciate this fairy gift i hear he is an excellent farmer understands all about subsoiling drainage cattle and such necessary horrors genevieve looked at the speaker novice as she was she divined the covert contempt lurking beneath the half patronizing half ironical compliments thus paid to paul and keeping her eyes still steadfastly fixed on her companion she rejoined my husband is not only a good farmer but an honorable upright man one whom the most indifferent of wives could not help respecting and loving there was something grand in its way in this fearless frank expression of her sentiments from one usually so reserved and reticent as genevieve durand and whilst de chevandier's heart inwardly did her homage for it it also awoke with him a sentiment of jealous irritation of the man thus favored and honored it taught him also that in the young wife's presence he must avoid uttering even one word that could possibly be construed as disrespectful towards paul and he hastened to repair his blunder by making some friendly complimentary remark regarding durand uttered with the tact and delicacy of which he was eminently master genevieve resumed her work and whilst her fingers moved with nimble skill de chevandier talked or read aloud short passages from the papers he had brought with him the afternoon shadows were lengthening when the young wife suddenly rose to her feet saying he must excuse her as she might be wanted at home he escorted her to the door and as he lingered at the steps saying a few farewell words two figures standing at an angle of the barn closely watched their movements these were manon the girl who had given so characteristic a reception to captain de chevandier and olivier dupuis one of the most inveterate gossips of the village and you tell me he said slowly ominously shaking his head you tell me that fine town gentleman comes here every day and spends hours with madame a scornful inflection on the word the husband too away well well paul durand you could not do like others and take a smart sensible girl of the village for your wife you wanted a dainty bit of china ware instead oh we shall see we shall see when do you expect paul home to-morrow i think good day then manon and should you ever marry don't tread in your mistress's footsteps keep your advice pere dupuis till it's asked when i'm married i shall do just as i like and with this amicable farewell the pair separated the rain poured down in torrents all the ensuing day and de chevandier had to forego his intention of calling on his charming neighbor lest a visit under such circumstances would render him ridiculous he therefore betook himself in a very ill humor to the sitting-room where he divided his time between tossing over mr de courval's books which were nearly all on agricultural subjects and kicking aside or swearing at the half-dozen dogs that enlivened the home of his bachelor friend genevieve on her part was as happy as possible the house under the united efforts of herself and handmaidens shone with cleanliness whilst manon by some extraordinary coincidence had made some excellent pies and turned out for once a baking of bread neither burned outside nor raw inside 
by way of climax the wonderful slippers happily completed for the occasion were ostentatiously spread out on the back of paul's armchair which was drawn to his favorite nook near the flower-filled window then genevieve hastened to her room and after a wistful look at the fast falling rain to whose violence her husband was probably then exposed entered with pretty wifely vanity on the duty of endeavoring to make herself look as charming as possible her task was not a difficult one for at all times pretty excitement rendered her doubly so and the flutter of pleasure arising from the expected return of her husband after this their first separation brought a light to her eyes and a flush on her cheek that made old dupuis's appellation of china ware passably appropriate End of chapter 3chapter four of armand durand by rosanna le proan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary meanwhile we will go back a few hours to meet paul on his homeward route rapidly he jolted on heedless of the miry roads of the rain so liberally deluging him in the happy prospect of soon being again with genevieve and in the satisfactory remembrance of the favorable business he had transacted in montreal tokens of which he had brought back in the shape of handsome presents for his wife unexpectedly he came upon old olivier dupuis trudging along on foot and apparently as heedless of the rain as himself of course paul drew up and offered the wayfarer a seat beside him a proposal accepted with an alacrity arising from more motives than one when started on the way again after a few words about the weather paul heartily said ah pere dupuis it cheers and shortens a long road wonderfully to know that there is a true kind wife at the end of it to welcome one olivier groaned aloud and dismally shook his head supposing this mournful outburst was a covert allusion on dupuis's part to his own state of widowhood paul though it was the first time he had known him to grieve on that account kindly said cheer up olivier all have their trials in this world some time or other and you have good health and good spirits to make up for your lonely fireside as for that paul durand was the tart reply i think myself much less to be pitied without a wife than many men are with one the tone even more than the words was peculiar and paul cast a keen glance at his companion yes look at me well and i only wish you could read in my face all that's on my mind it would save me telling things which i won't be thanked i suppose for making known oh paul paul why couldn't you do as your neighbors and forefathers did before you choose a wife from among the smart honest girls of your parish instead of going farther to fare worse assuredly neighbor dupuis you have been taking somebody else's allowance of rum this morning atop of your own was paul's angrily uttered reply this last insinuation shot home for old dupuis often exceeded the bounds of temperance though he had not done so on this particular occasion so with a malicious twinkle in his little sharp eyes he replied thank you for the hint good friend but i've met no christian to-day generous enough to offer me his share that's neither here nor there however and we need not fight because i think it my duty to tell an old friend and neighbor out of kindness when i see his wife carrying on and amusing herself when he's away with one of the beautifully dressed perfumed young gentlemen visiting at the seigneur's ah you may well turn pale for it's true they spent three whole hours in the garden alone yesterday manon saw them too so she can tell you the same story and the day before that widow la pointe saw them talking together under the apple tree in the garden she says she stood watching them for nearly an hour and the fine gentleman was all smiles and sweetness to madame again a marked emphasis on the title 
dupuis was small in stature feeble and gray-haired so paul who possessed herculean strength was too generous to gratify his vengeance by using personal violence towards him he was therefore obliged to content himself with snatching him up suddenly by the back of his coat collar and dropping him as he would have done a troublesome puppy in the middle of the miry road then with the one muttered word coquin rascal he lashed his horse furiously and set off at a breakneck speed along the uneven road after a time however he allowed the animal's pace to slacken the reins to fall on its neck and bowing his head in his hands he groaned aloud yes yes it must be true the thought was agony unspeakable but that did not diminish the likelihood of its truth he remembered now how that elegant gentleman's gaze had pertinaciously and admiringly followed his wife's movements during the short visit he had paid with mr de courval at their house and he recalled with a feeling of mingled rage and despair that she had unaccountably at least to him refused to accompany him to town durand was by nature of a fiercely jealous temperament but this failing had hitherto lain almost dormant from want of circumstances favorable to its development now all at once it leaped into existence with as much strength and vitality as if it had blazed unrestrained all his life his anger toward his wife was softened now and then by a pang of grief or wounded tenderness but his rage against de chevandier was deadly and had the latter crossed his path during that homeward drive the consequences might have been of a fatal nature as he turned into the yard the gate of which stood open in expectation of his arrival he nervously shrank from the thought of meeting his wife he knew beforehand reproaching and accusing her would afford him no satisfaction and he asked himself would it not be better to drive at once to the manor-house ask for de chevandier and without a word of commentary or explanation fall upon him and take full vengeance for his wrongs serving mr de courval with a small dose of the same treatment if he ventured to interfere for after all he was the indirect author of all this misery bringing with him into virtuous humble homes his unprincipled fashionable friends whilst he still sat wavering in purpose reins in hand the door opened and genevieve in her fresh girlish beauty ran out and poising her little foot lightly on the iron step held up her blushing face to kiss him naturally shy and undemonstrative nothing but her deep love for her husband could have tempted her so far out of her usual reserve but turning aside his head as if not comprehending her intention he harshly said go in out of the rain what a fierce pang of anguish shot through her heart as he spoke the words he had had such love such trust in her and she was so winning so lovable so gentle in appearance whatever she might be in reality leaping from his seat he unharnessed his horse led him to the stable and declining the assistance of one of the farm servants who hastened to help him he fed watered and rubbed the animal down himself feeling then that the dreaded explanation between himself and his wife could no longer be averted he strode into the house the cloth was laid supper on the table and genevieve standing waiting for him but how different that pale shrinking woman to the blushing joyous creature that had bounded down so lightly a few moments before to welcome him ruthlessly flinging away the embroidered slippers in the midst of poor genevieve's bewildered anguish that little act inflicted a special pang of its own he seated himself at table but food and drink remained untouched except a large tumbler of cold water which he swallowed at a draught he then pushed back his chair what does it all mean the trembling young wife asked herself for the twentieth time and her cheek grew paler and her lips whiter till she almost feared she would faint the hue of guilt thought paul ah the worthless hypocrite at length she spoke paul what is the matter with you why do you treat me thus first answer me a question woman 
what visitors have you had here in my absence no one but captain de chevandier she faltered ah it is true then and you have the audacity to acknowledge it this speech was certainly inconsistent on paul's part for if she had concealed the truth he would have been if possible more enraged with her but when was anger ever logical or consistent her reply however was a fearful confirmation of the reports he had heard and in a hoarse husky voice he asked how often three times that is every day during my absence except to-day when either the fear of my return or of exposing his dainty person to the rain kept him at home oh false worthless woman what can i what do i think of the wife who profits of a husband's absence to pass hours every day in the company of a total stranger whose only claims on her are that he is young handsome and unprincipled oh on my sacred word paul i will swear it on the bible if you like i have never wronged you my husband by one word or thought without any invitation from me captain de chevandier called here moved only by a feeling of politeness or courtesy silence i say do you think you can blind me to your misdoings as easily as that ah you have proved yourself an ungrateful as well as a false wife though you have made ourselves and our home a laughing-stock in the village through your miserable ignorance of everything that a woman should know i have never spoken an angry word to you never even given you a cold look on that account but you spend the time that other women pass in honest useful housework in listening to the sweet words of a scoundrel in trifling with your husband's honour paul you are cruel and unjust silence i tell you do you not know that to-morrow the wretched gossips in whose power you have so weakly so criminally placed yourself will have held us both up to public scorn out of my sight she rose and with a feeling of deathly sickness crept from the room the fiercest enemy paul durand ever had would have felt his desire of vengeance sated if he could have looked into that silent chamber and into the depths of the occupant's heart as he sat there in lonely wretchedness his aching head bowed on his crossed arms unnoting the thickening shadows of twilight unconscious of the long day's fast which he had but lightly broken once in the anticipation of the pleasant evening meal to be partaken of in his own home with her by degrees his first violence gave way to softer thoughts and feelings what if genevieve had only erred through inexperience or thoughtlessness had been guilty of no greater fault than simply permitting de chevandier's visits without either inviting or encouraging them well it was almost as bad for he had said words in his anger which few women could easily forget or forgive and he felt a spirit of dogged sullenness rising within him which would prevent him making anything like advances even if convinced that he had unjustly accused her he foresaw it all the estrangement that henceforth would arise like a wall between them an estrangement which time would only deepen and they had been so happy together he had known such perfect bliss in his home since she had come to it she had entwined herself so closely around his very being in anguish unutterable he groaned aloud a light footfall crossed the floor and looking up he saw genevieve beside him she placed the candle she carried on the table and even in the trouble of the moment he noted how deathly pale she was and how weeping and mental suffering had already left dark rings beneath her soft eyes suddenly conviction awoke within him that she was innocent of all wilful offence and with that thought a terrible fear flashed across his mind that she had come to say she would leave him that he had insulted outraged her beyond forgiveness it was just such gentle quiet women as she who did such things and he knew he felt that the demon of sullen pride within him would keep him dumb that even though his heart should break he should make no sign and let her depart very softly then 
she spoke paul i am sorry truly sorry that i have angered you thus had i known that you would have disapproved of captain de chevandier's visits i should have refused to receive them even at the risk of insulting without provocation a friend of mr de courval's hear me swear now before god as solemnly as if i were on my deathbed here she knelt beside him and reverently raised upwards her clear earnest eyes shining with the light of truth that i am innocent of one thought or word that could in any manner have wronged you surely you will forgive my unintentional offence passionately convulsively he strained her to his heart and as he held her there he inwardly registered a vow that never again would he grieve contradict or doubt her that feminine gentleness more powerful than anger logic or pride had demolished in an instant the wall that passion and suspicion had raised between them my wife my darling he whispered as the tears his honest manly nature no longer felt ashamed of fell thickly on the glossy head resting against his breast thank god we are at peace again may this be our last as it has been our first quarrel it was and no look of doubt or anger on either side darkened the course of their later married life the next day when captain de chevandier called he was told that mrs durand was too busy to receive him when he repeated his visits which he took good care to do at a time when he knew durand was from home having seen him pass on his way to the back of the farm he doubtless flattered himself with the prospect of a different answer but the reply was the same coupled with the additional mortification of seeing genevieve at one of the windows engaged in no more important occupation than that of trimming the plants and flowers in the window with a muttered curse he turned away and the next day bade farewell to alonville never to return to it matters after this went on very quietly at the durand homestead but though perfect peace and affection reigned within it there was no perceptible change in the domestic economy of the establishment still honest paul was thoroughly satisfied thoroughly happy so that after all was the chief point the slanderous gossip propagated by old dupuis soon died out for want of something new to feed upon genevieve continued to enjoy with the same zest sunshine birds and flowers satisfying her conscience now and then by a desperate effort at housekeeping which after causing her intense worry for some time she would quietly abandon a token of mrs chartrand's thoughtfulness soon arrived in the shape of a large parcel accompanied by a note from that lady saying that as she supposed paul would soon require new shirts she had taken the liberty of sending a dozen cut out according to a pattern of his she had in her possession she knew the making of them would be only an amusement for her sister-in-law of course the young wife willingly undertook the task and when paul left for his fields in the morning he carried with him in imagination a pleasant picture of his pretty genevieve seated at her little table armed with a dainty thimble and scissors and a pile of snow-white cotton and linen before her but alas genevieve's good intentions were frustrated not by want of will but of ability she got confused utterly bewildered between gussets bands and pieces and finally disheartened and discouraged she put her work hopelessly down before her she left it and returned to it twice thrice during the course of the day but with like result whilst sitting with her hands lying listlessly in her lap thinking how willingly she would exchange the little embroidering talent she possessed for the art of reducing the chaos of white strips before her to order paul hot and wearied with his toil under a burning sun entered instinctively she caught up the sewing which had made so little progress since morning and then glanced towards her husband he had seated himself and was wiping the thick drops of perspiration from his flushed forehead 
such a contrast in his hot weariness to her own repose as she sat quiet in that cool shady room and yet how dispirited how listless how miserable she felt in the midst of her ease well little wife how goes the sewing he kindly asked she threw it down again and bursting into tears sobbed forth tis no use keeping up a fiction i understand nothing about it paul paul you have a useless worthless wife pushing away the work he drew her kindly towards him whispering heaven is witness genevieve that you render my home pleasant to myself and happy what can woman do more don't worry yourself about such trifles your sweetness and patience render you more dear to me than if you were the most notable cook and seamstress in the parish tie all that up in a bundle and this evening we will drive to widow lapointe's and leave it with her it will be a charity to make her earn a trifle and the drive will make you as cheerful as a linnet they soon started and though gossips wondered at paul's infatuation and singular blindness to the shortcomings and utter uselessness of his wife she pursued her way more petted and indulged than ever before another year the cup of paul's happiness was filled to overflowing by the birth of a son no titled nobleman longing for an heir to bear an old and time-honoured name no millionaire anxious for a son to inherit his vast wealth rejoices more over the birth of a male child than does the humble canadian peasant either it is that he too likes to see his obscure though honest name perpetuated or that he knows a son's strong arm will bring him help in his agricultural labors at a time when he knows old age will render such assistance almost indispensable such is certainly the case but alas paul's joy like all earth's gleams of sunshine was short-lived and genevieve's health always frail and delicate never rallied after the birth of her child day by day she grew weaker and despite the affection the watchful tenderness with which paul surrounded her despite her own boundless clinging love for husband and child the parting hour came and patient resigned she softly breathed out her life in the strong arms that had proved so secure a resting-place to her since she had first known their shelter ah paul durand as you sat lonely and almost broken-hearted in your room no sound breaking its haunted silence but the monotonous ticking of the tall clock standing in the corner and looking back remembered the weariness and languor with which at times she moved about and the colour that went and came with every trifling exertion you divined the secret of the want of energy for which idle tongues had so often blamed her and you reverently thanked your god that you had never reproached or taunted her with it never harshly urged her to exertions and efforts which were beyond her strength perhaps durand's greatest solace was found in this thought and in the petting of his infant son who possessed all his mother's delicacy of feature and it was to be feared much of her fragility of constitution now in his isolation paul would willingly have accepted the companionship of his sister but that worthy lady wearying of her weeds had already consented to exchange them for nuptial garments and was to be married in a few months to a respectable notary somewhat advanced in years but who possessed a good practice and quiet temper points mrs chartrand had taken care to fully satisfy herself on before giving an affirmative answer to his suit it was not so much on account of household waste and mismanagement that paul desired his sister's presence for by this time he had become thoroughly accustomed to both but it was for his child's sake that tender little nursling wanted more judicious care than the fitful kindness or ignorant companionship of servants once convinced that there was no chance of mrs chartrand's coming to live with him he resolved to marry again 
ah what a shame some reader may exclaim how could he so soon forget the fair young wife who had nestled for a time on his hearth and next his heart he did not forget her and long years after in the solemn hour when life's last scenes were receding from his misty sight the hope that he was again to meet her absorbed every earthly regret End of chapter 4chapter five of armand durand by rosanna le proan this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary it was for the love of genevieve that paul sought a mother for genevieve's child and that thought exclusively guided him in his second choice careless of youth beauty or rustic dower he passed by many a bright-eyed rose-lipped girl who would have smiled on his suit and selected a plain-featured but amiable virtuous girl already regarded in the parish as an old maid knowing that she would replace to his idolized son as far as woman could do the young mother he had so early lost the day he asked eulalie messier to be his wife he frankly explained to her his reasons for changing his single state quietly adding that he esteemed and respected her and would endeavor to make a good husband but he never mentioned the word love eulalie was amply satisfied and thankful alike to providence and paul for her total want of dower as well as personal attractions seemed to have irrevocably condemned her to a state of single blessedness which in her case signified a life of isolation and unending toil paul's second wedding took place on a scorching day in july a month capable of inflicting as much fiery inconvenience on the inhabitants of this land of snow and ice as if we dwelt beneath the tropics many of our readers may remember the inimitable description given by dickens in little dorrit of a hot day in marseilles in which the broiling pavements and blistering walls are enlarged upon whilst luckless pedestrians are described as plunging into the sultry fierce glare of the sunlight and swimming for their lives to the nearest strip of shade just such a temperature was it in allonville on the day of the important event above alluded to no ripple stirring the smooth clear waters of our magnificent st lawrence as it flowed majestically past mirroring back the pretty villages nestling coquettishly on its banks no breath of air stirring the trees the long grass the weeds and wild flowers that bordered the roadside and filled every dell and hollow looking in their sultry immovability as if painted on canvas what a very sahara seemed the closely shaven clover fields the yellow stubble reflecting fiercely back the molten sunlight that poured down on it and how hot and scorched the poor cornfields looked each stalk bending it seemed not so much beneath its weight of grain as under the merciless heat till they seemed to claim pity almost as much as the kine and sheep that panted and gasped beneath the meagre shadow of fence and outbuilding or the few isolated trees spared here and there on the land insect life however held full jubilee and flies buzzed bees hummed crickets grasshoppers sang chirped till their united efforts made up almost in volume of sound if not music for the silence of the birds that mutely nestled amid the drooping foliage before the neat little village church a number of vehicles were gathered the horses of which were tied to the numerous posts which usually dot the green sward in front of the country places of worship soon the owners of said vehicles came out of the sacred edifice and with brisk interchange of jokes and a fund of gaiety that rendered them indifferent to if not unconscious of the scorching atmosphere the cavalcade proceeded to the bridegroom's house festivities of any kind in the bride's poverty-stricken home being of course out of the question paul would have preferred by far having his second marriage on the same quiet simple scale as the first but his friends protested so energetically 
indeed indignantly against such an unsocial proceeding that he was obliged to sacrifice his own wishes and conform to theirs and to custom we need not say that on the morning in question the durand homestead from attic to cellar was in a state of shining as well as hospitable preparation huge nosegays some placed in cracked jugs or tumblers graced every available spot whilst a long table draped in snow-white country linen was plentifully set out with delf and glasses when the lively party entered the house the fairer portion proceeded to divest themselves of their large straw hats and to shake out their calico skirts taking turns for surveying their smiling faces at the one looking-glass adorning the bedroom wall and whose shining surface rewarded each beholder with a distorted semblance of self enough not only to subdue effectually any lurking vanity the fair gazer might have possessed but in some cases to cause them to recoil in horrified amazement jugs of cider and ale with raspberry syrup a summer beverage most canadian housekeepers can make to perfection were handed freely round and shortly after amid remarks on the heat and the crops they gathered round the table and the village cure who occupied the post of honour having said grace they attacked the dainty fare before them the supply was indeed most bountiful consisting of poultry sausages cold roast pork smoking pancakes fruit tarts honey and preserves with large heaped-up plates of brown crisp crullers that never-failing cake a plate of which is always to be found on canadian tables bottles of rum and sherry the latter chiefly intended for the women kind were placed at reasonable distances around the board seated at the upper end were bride and bridegroom paul looked calm and quite at his ease but nothing could equal the magnificent self-possession of the bride who sat in her new place as composedly as if she had occupied it for the last ten years her black hair which by the way was really glossy and abundant was brushed back as simply as possible from her temples and her toilette though irreproachably neat had evidently been chosen with a view to utility and as strong a contempt for finery as distinguished that of her worthy husband the expression of her countenance was frank and honest as well as good-humoured with unruffled tranquillity she listened to jokes and innuendos to the laboured and intentional repetition of her new name without blush or token of embarrassment till at length the most industrious jester the wit of the party having emptied every arrow in his quiver without once putting her out of countenance declared to a neighbour that he would really find more pleasure in quizzing his grandmother his discomfiture however in no manner interfered with the general hilarity and merriment singing and talking went on whilst keener appetites had perhaps never been displayed even in the bracing hunger inspiring days of winter at length the party rose from the table and during the confusion of changing seats the men filling pipes which they did with tobacco taken from small pouches carried on their persons durand made a sign to his new-made wife and she comprehending him instantly rose and quietly followed him out into a narrow passage terminating in a steep staircase leading to the upper part of the house the ceiling of this flat was very low but the same air of comfort reigned here as below and in a little crib spread with coarse but beautifully white linen slept a pretty child of two years old laying his broad sunburned hand lightly as a rose-leaf on the sleeping child's forehead paul durand said with a slight tremor in his voice my motherless child Hulalie, you will be a mother to him will you not the woman looked in silence at the little sleeper the face was one of great loveliness and even in that early stage of life the perfect regularity of the features gave sure promise of later beauty perhaps awakened by the father's light touch the child opened its large hazel eyes that acquired a still darker hue from the long heavy lashes that shadowed them and looked up quietly wondering at the unknown female face bending over it 
surprised perhaps pained by her silence durand resumed you have not answered me eulalie will you not be a mother to my poor boy a faint flush stole over the bride's cheek the first that had visited it that evening though it was her wedding day kneeling beside the cradle she tenderly kissed the child whispering yes may god give me grace to do my duty towards it well then for a moment her lips moved either in silent prayer or promise and when she rose to her feet there was a look in her face that told paul she was resolved to keep her promise a look which rendered her more beautiful in his eyes than if roses and dimples instead of lines of care and hardship marked her countenance quietly the newly wedded couple went back to their guests the father carrying his boy who of course was ready attired in all his finery for the occasion and mrs durand bore the new storm of jests and compliments that saluted her return with her usual serenity after little armand had been duly admired and caressed some worthy dames smothering a sigh as they whispered among themselves the ominous word stepmother he was handed back to the girl who had had charge of him since his mother's death and who stood at the door scowling in turn at each individual who touched her nursling for lisette's temper on that joyous day was sadly soured not so much by the general festivities as by the special circumstance that had given rise to it the day wore on fiercer and fiercer blazed the sun the great river as one of the guests reproachfully said would not spare them even a whiff of air to blow the smoke curl from their pipes but despite that eating drinking smoking went on varied by singing and dancing which in the then state of the temperature was a species of self-immolation almost incredible everybody was delighted and the general merriment never flagged though the doctor of the village young and unmarried was among the guests together with his brother an equally untrammelled notary from montreal both amusing and agreeable more than one feminine breast heaved a sigh inwardly acknowledging that the new bride despite her plainness of feature and the title of old maid with which they generally qualified her behind her back had indeed secured the first marital prize in allonville the wedding festivities lasted for eight days being celebrated alternately at the houses of the different relatives of the newly wedded pair and then when all parties were thoroughly tired out with pleasure things returned to their usual course and perfect quiet settled down in the household of paul durand there was not much danger of paul's second wife making him forget the first for eulalie was singularly taciturn and matter-of-fact and could spend hours in company with her husband without uttering a word or encouraging him to do so but she was a rare housekeeper and dairy poultry-yard and garden flourished under her auspices even as they had done under those of paul's worthy mother oh restless human heart how often in the midst of the comfort cleanliness and thrift that now surrounded him paul looked back with a longing aching heart to the period of misrule which had been rendered happiness to him by the love and companionship of the idolized young wife he had so early lost he knew though and acknowledged the sterling worth and good qualities of the second mrs durand whilst she never obtaining a look into the closed chambers of his heart averred that he was one of the best and most devoted of husbands she took the little armand to her heart at once and though naturally undemonstrative caressed and petted him with all a good woman's devotion the time came when she had another child to fondle but when she had rendered durand the father of a strong robust boy she made no distinction between the children and little paul did not rob his brother armand of a single particle of her affection and watchful care 
of course this new tie between husband and wife was a powerful one and he began to feel a deeper interest in her a more anxious desire for her health and happiness than he had yet done when again inexorable death stepped in and deprived him of his wife just as he was beginning to feel sincerely attached to her a malignant fever contracted in the chill rainy season of autumn sufficed to prostrate that active strong frame full of energy and health and the second wife was laid beside the first just two short years after she had taken her place as paul sat in his mourning clothes the day of the funeral and remembered that he was now burdened with two helpless children instead of one whilst he was more lonely than ever he inwardly determined that he would not venture on matrimony again but come what would he would endeavour to struggle through the battle of life companionless destiny however had some comfort in store for him after some months his sister's husband henri ratel paid the debt of nature dutifully and kindly tended by his wife to the last the new-made widow briefly wrote to her brother paul do you want me to which he briefly rejoined yes without delay and she came you see brother it was written that we should live together we both married a couple of times almost it seemed to evade it but it was to be i am satisfied if you are paul was amply so and gave all just authority to this new regent of his household nor was his confidence misplaced she proved herself well worthy of it and in no respect more so than in her judicious care of her brother's two young sons she had never been blessed with children and her kindly nature yearned over the two thus confided to her charge as if they had been indeed her very own the two boys were as different in disposition as they were in physical characteristics and whilst armand with his mother's fragile beauty was sensitive reticent and quiet paul possessed the manly vigor of his father but was besides turbulent and thoughtless both durand and his sister treated the children with perfect equality and if at times paul in watching the strong resemblance his eldest son bore to his fair young mother felt his heart yearn towards him as it had once done towards his idolized first wife he never evinced the feeling by any outward token of preference End of chapter 5